Um, so just a little about me briefly. Um, I've been programming for years. I've been uh, web languages for about two years. Um, in 2015, I put a focus on cybersecurity and code um, and, and how our code uh, can be attacked and how our development process should change. Um, WSL is a lot of for me. Um, I am not a rock star developer in any sense of the word, um, and I'm hoping that I can learn from you guys today just as much as you're learning from me a little bit. Um, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the history uh, of web development, um, struggles we've seen over that history, and how WSL is now changing that. So um, going back in history, uh, back to 1998, when Elon Musk and his brother founded PayPal, he and his brother had no dedicated servers and one computer, and that one computer also hosted PayPal.com. So every day PayPal.com was up and running, and every night PayPal was down so Elon and his brother could continue to program it. They didn't have a real versioning system. Um, I tried to do research on IDEs that might have existed at the time, and it seems like they're few and far between. And this is 10 years before the creation of Stack Overflow, which is, we all know, the hardest working developer on our team. So that's where basically where it really started. Um, by 2003, we had things like shared hosting. Hosting website became affordable for many companies, and few developers with some money could spend that uh, extra money after upgrading their 48 systems. If they could, they could get their hosting. Um, that made it a lot easier to develop. You weren't relying on having your own system anymore. You didn't need your own data center anymore. Made it good, um, but uh, price was still a barrier for a lot of people. Um, developers with the processing power could run local LAMP or WAMP. Um, if they didn't have the power, they would have to write and test their code and then start up the service and then spin it down and edit their code again and then try to spin it back up. Um, Again, and this is still five years out from Stack Overflow. So develop it getting easier, but it's still not easy at that point. Um, jumping uh, 10 years ahead, the world is safe. We have IDEs, we have Git, we have um, Git for Windows, uh, for us Windows developers. Shared hosting has gotten cheaper at this point. Um, it's three to five dollars a month. As a developer, life should be good except that accessible hosting isn't Git compatible and frequently uses out-of-date versions of your software. So you're developing on your system for PHP 5 and your host only has PHP 4. Um, and uh, most of those hosting environments were only available via FTP, not SFTP, regular old FTP. Um, at this time, I was actually working at GoDaddy and the most common issues we saw were developers struggling to take their code from their local environments, getting up on the server and getting it to work because what they were working with locally was not the same as what was on the server all the time. Um, it was designed to work against us is what I feel like it was. Um, but 2013, we get dockers and containers and this is where things really start to get going. Docker certainly changed the way that we develop and deploy our code. We're now in charge of what's in our images, the software we use. We can ensure the code works the same on the server as it does on our, our development machines. Um, but there's still barriers. Git for Windows is kind of slow and heavy, in my opinion. It hasn't really worked the way I need it to. PowerShell at this time is out. It does most of what I need, but I'm still switching between the two. It just wasn't streamlined. But Microsoft came and changed that. Um, Microsoft finally figured out if you can't beat them, join them when it came to Linux, and um, they started to really build a mecca for what, what turned me from a system admin back into a developer. While I was still using PowerShell, Bash on Windows runs faster than the alternatives I've used. Um, it gives me all of my favorite Linux tools right on Windows. I don't have to switch between boxes, and it keeps my environment as native as possible. I went from running a Windows machine and a Linux machine, um, carrying around two laptops, to having uh, WSL available to me uh, natively. Uh, Microsoft approved VS Code, Docker for Windows, which is still technically third party, but it runs so smoothly at this point, it's hard to say it's not native. 
So why am I getting going through all this history? Talk about WSL. WSL was truly the missing link that developers needed to streamline into a single platform. I'm not using a local or remote server to develop anymore. I'm not developing on WAMP or something similar. Um, I'm developing on my config and I have all the tools I need to do it. And I'm not relying on inconvenient or insecure technologies like FTP anymore. Now I live in a single ecosystem where I can be a developer and my system ad can, admin can manage the server or dedicated server, whatever it may be. I don't have to worry about that. WSL has made me a developer again um, instead of a system admin trying to figure out why my code doesn't work everywhere. It's that old adage, it works on my machine. Not anymore. Uh, now it works everywhere. Um, so I wanted to jump in and use WSL a little bit to show you just how easy it is just to get started with development on WSL these days. So I'm actually going to open up the command prompt. So from the command prompt, I'm just going to type batch and press enter, and I'm immediately in my shell. That is so easy and convenient. Um, I've pre-installed a few services, but I'm going to go ahead and start sudo service start. And this is on Ubuntu, um, just the latest image. Uh, to start. Then in my browser. Immediately, I'm already starting to develop. I don't know if that's big enough, but it says, hello, WS comp, wash your hands, Seattle. And then immediately within uh, DS code, uh, I'm ready to start editing. That's it. That easy. Um, but that's just to get started if you're just doing a basic project. In this case, I'm running a lot of services like Docker. Um, so I'm actually going to close this real quick and reopen it because I don't know what that was. And uh, just run it with Docker now. It's, it's, it's that easy for um, what I'm doing. Uh, um, ah, so, um, oop. As I uh, mentioned in the introduction, I'm working with um, a company called um, Cerebrum Corp. Uh, we make a laboratory software. Um, we develop with WSL, um, switched over from a few other technologies and, and pared everything down into um, Windows for Linux and then made all of our, our Docker and startup scripts um, uh, native to Linux and we just uh, run everything from the go. So. Um, we have custom Docker script, and that just gets me going. Bam, it's up and running. And immediately I'm getting to work on our project. And then in addition to that, um, when I jump into it with uh, Visual Studio Code, Yep, that's the right folder. From within Visual Studio Code, I can still connect to um, uh, Bash right from my uh, terminal, right inside VS Code. I can manage my software from here if I need to know what's going on with um, my project. Am I running? Oh, for some reason I didn't like that. Am I not running Bash? Hmm, whatever. Um, and without doing anything different, because we're running WSL, because we've configured everything with Linux, uh, because we're using Docker with volumes, um, I don't have to stop and start anything. I can change my code on the fly and start editing my PHP or my HTML or any CSS, and bam, I am just working. When it's done, I use um, my WSL again, check my kit, 
push my code up, and then it goes off to the uh, uh, um, system admins for them to deploy our code once uh, approved testing. So uh, for as long as I've been writing code, I've been a system admin and a developer and had to manage everything because of the way it's set up. With WSL integrated into our systems, all I have to do is develop code now. I don't have to worry about anything else. Um, it's simplifying my life as a developer, and it's pared me down to one laptop with one source and almost everything native aside from Docker itself. That's how WSL is making me a developer again. Um, let's uh, rail a little quick there, but um, I did want to open to questions, discussions, to see if anybody else is using it in different ways that I'm not thinking of, or if anybody has questions that I can help answer. So, uh, can I ask uh, what distro do you use? Uh, yeah, I use typically just use Ubuntu because it's it's quick and easy. It starts up uh, fast. Um, within Docker itself, where we're actually pulling uh, Debian engines, but for uh, Debian in, uh, images, but for uh, WSL uh, with the Ubuntu image, I'm getting all of my Linux tools right there. I don't have to make a lot of modifications to it. Gotcha. And uh, I'm not going to. Okay, here's a question from the audience How do you handle uh, unit and system testing locally? Uh, so for that, that's actually built into the way we've we frameworked our system. Um, our engineer uh, wrote several scripts um, uh, in Bash, and um, uh, unfortunately, I can't show you a lot of the code because it's proprietary. Uh, but I can right. explain how it works. Um, but basically, what's going on is uh, when we run that Bash command, it's going in and creating a new database of Docker taking test code that we have, in this case, it's patient data, it's inserting the system automatically, um, using SQL to pull it out and then doing assertions against it to ensure that whatever we've put in is coming out properly. And that's that's basically one of the tests we run. Gotcha. Are you using uh, any JavaScript frameworks like Gatsby or any of those? Uh, I, uh, no. Or can you not tell? Can you not tell us? It's okay if you can. No, I, I can tell you in that uh, we use as little JavaScript as prospect, um, and the reason for that is, is security. Um, I mentioned that a little bit of history in cybersecurity. Um, right. We, through research, it's it's been determined that using a lot of libraries leads to security issues, unfortunately. Um, right. We've got a large 4,000 line JavaScript library. You're importing a lot of things, you, you know, a couple things you need and a lot of things you don't. And it's hard to tell if anything in that 4,000 lines is going to lead to a cybersecurity issue or a hole in your code that could be exploited. Gotcha. So we, um, we, uh, we're we using uh, jQuery minimum level, um, but for our next version, we're looking to strictly go with vanilla JS. Gotcha. Um, let's see. Now, you, you mentioned, and I'm not going to let this get by because I'm a nerd, that you develop uh, software for lab equipment. Um, sure. How does your does your code interact with the lab equipment, or is it just front end? Uh, it does interact with the lab equipment um, and a, a lot of lab equipment. And for that, um, for me as a developer, I'm not personally doing that. We have two developers to do that. Um, our software has two development settings where I can turn off the equipment interactions. Um, and that's how I'm set up where if I try to print something without those sets, it's gonna return an error saying, hey, we can't find the printer. Um, but we do right. have, uh, um, uh, basically when you send a tissue sample off to the lab, they now put a QR code on it. And that goes from station to station where it gets checked. So our system will print those QR codes onto the sample trays. Um, and to get that to interact with our web systems, we have a custom uh, Java um, program that somebody wrote for us. Interesting. Now, and does it have an API that you uh, connect to, or uh, how so does that So our, our, ent our entire model is based on uh, the, the Jeff Bezos API model, which is everything is an API at Amazon. 
um, our entire system is API based. Um, anytime oh. you're using the interface at all, you're calling APIs. If you're inputting a sample or updating patient information at all, it all calls APIs. Gotcha. Now you mentioned volumes. Um, are you using uh, database volumes? Is that, is that what you're referring to? So we're, we're using volumes a couple different ways. We're using uh, volumes to, um, once Docker started, we, we create a volume to where, so the database can be automatically imported by the bash scripting. And then mm -hmm. um, our code is stored uh, in, a, in a volume uh, setup. So we can um, edit the code like you saw where I made the changes and immediately showed up in Docker inside the container. Right. Okay. Uh, that's that's fascinating. Um, okay. Have you experimented with any other different kinds of container technologies? Um, a, a couple different ones. Um, what it came down to was for our clients' needs, Docker and Kubernetes really just solves all the problems is what it comes down to. Is and that again again because of all the, the proprietary stuff we're doing, I can just tell you that Docker is easiest to get inside of a large laboratory. Um, when you're dealing with things like HIPAA and uh, stringent IT and making sure that um, whatever you use is accessible. That's interesting. Um, that that opens a good question for me. Uh, how much does HIPAA and health regulations affect your job directly as a developer? Um, it affects it a lot. We we anything we do has to be approved. Um, when we we do get sample data, um, patient data, but we're never allowed to touch or use real patient data, um, which is kind of weird because we you know with all the the unit testing and functional testing we do. Um, right. We're never actually looking at real data. We have to rely on the client to provide us uh, mostly JSON. They provide us JSON of fake uh, client information. Hmm. Okay. But at the same time, our testing has to check for things like it will actually read correctly, that equipment read it properly. So we have to simulate that. Uh, if we put in a tissue sample and it's not correct, did our system catch it? Hmm. That's a whole new kind of unit testing. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I think um, our next presenter is ready. Uh, let me see if there's any more questions from the audience for you. I think there was question. one other question. Um, it just cool. said, yeah, you list a history of overcoming various challenges that WSL has helped solve. I'm curious if you have other obstacles you still encounter that you think need to be or can be solved by WSL and the community? So it's, I, I think Microsoft is, is working hard at solving those problems already with um, the, the integrations they have with uh, Visual Studio Code. They have a, a Docker add-on that Microsoft has already developed. They have WSL integrations. Uh, with those integrations, I, if I'm using something like Azure, I can push my code right up to Azure from Visual Studio Code, right from Docker, using the WSL integrations. So, uh, personally, I haven't. I don't know what else we can else do to streamline it at this point. The fact that the Linux kernel is running natively on a Windows operating system is amazing. Um, but, I, for a long time, for about 10 years, I was strictly a Linux user. I didn't have a Windows machine. Um, and that comes with its own set of challenges. Like most of my bosses had never used Linux and they didn't want to buy me a computer or I was the only guy in the office using Linux. Um, it also created issues with joining virtual meetings like this where not all the software is Linux compatible. And now with everything running, just running on Windows, it's fine. I would agree. Gotcha. I think the the quote of the day is uh, WSL helped me be a developer again and I think you found a community here who would agree with you so right. thank you Great. so much